Hello again, this is Ab at Time for Clocks. Welcome to another episode. And finally, the last installment in my Seikosha repair series. The series has been so drawn out because of the climactic events in my life <laughs> in the past year. It's just, it was, it's been a tumultuous ride. But now, the dust is settling and I'm able to go forward with clock repair. Okay, now remember this is an amateur clock repair and history channel so I always tell people keep your expectations low and if Mike is watching I'm not putting myself down this is just a form of humor that they call self-deprecatory. Essentially it's when you make fun of yourself if you can't laugh at yourself, you have problems. So, we're just going to push forward and get this episode finished. Get the clock finished, hopefully running. It has been sitting around in the shop for such a long time that everything had dust on it, so I had to go back I had to go back and clean, do some polishing and so forth. And I'm I'm not even sure where I left off, but some things that I'm going to do off camera, such as the, I still have one spring to clean, and I showed you how to clean that, clean the spring, the main spring, in in a previous episode. This one, see, has some rust on there still. And when I stretch out the spring, when I clean it, that should help take about take out some of that. Uh, what they call set in the uh, in the coils. The other spring was very similar, and after I cleaned it, it actually looked pretty good. So I'm going to reuse it. And after cleaning and stretching this one a little bit, I think this will be good too. So I'm going to use the original springs that were in there and see how it runs. And if it doesn't run good, then or properly, I can always replace the springs at a future time, but if you can, you might as well use what's there. A lot of these springs, they last a long time. Uh, one, other, one other thing I want to mention is that the... Uh, when, I, when you clean the clock parts, of course, this one's been sitting around for months and months and months. It's already starting to tarnish again after I cleaned it. But generally, the different clock cleaning solutions, they make the brass real bright so it looks real nice and clean and so forth. And one uh, subscriber asked me about clock cleaning solutions. And really, the brightness of the brass, that's just for really visual effect. If you take a dirty clock in to be cleaned, you won't feel so bad paying a huge sum to have your your clock cleaned when you see how beautiful and pretty it is. But the shininess doesn't affect how it works. And traditionally, kerosene was actually used. Just kerosene in a brush. The old timers used it for who knows how many years. And many of the videos I've seen in Japan from clock repair people, they still use kerosene and a brush. It doesn't get the brass super bright, like I said, but it does clean it. And you want to get the clock running, really that's all, that's all you really need. On the camera it looks nice. If you're a professional and you have customers, it looks nice. It's pretty, wow, you must have done something, it's so shiny. But effectually, it doesn't affect the running of the movement. And also, can people, there was a How to Repair Pendulum, pendulum Clocks channel uh, from a nice fellow in the UK, and he's actually a conservator. He does conservative uh, restoration and so forth of clocks, museum quality, and he prefers kerosene with a brush also, hand cleaning, even the springs. And I, I just I just wanted to mention that I like to see it nice and bright, but 
it's not necessary. And if you just have kerosene, it's good enough. The um, Now, when I cleaned all these parts, and they were pretty dirty if you saw the first video when I took the movement apart, or the second video, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to be skipping a few steps. I'm not going to be doing any pivot polishing or anything like that. Many times when you have an old clock and it stops running, all it needs is to be cleaned up and it'll and re-oiled and it'll keep going unless there's really something wrong with it, unless there's severe damage. The I looked at the pivots and they're, they're still pretty good, so I'm not going to sweat about any bushing work or anything unless it's I find something excessive. So basically this video is showing people and many have asked how to put the movement back together so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to get it back together so let's get on with it. Okay another lengthy introduction but I'm glad you're here and hopefully this video is will help me get into the mode of making more of them because I have a lot of things to show. All right, let's get to it. Thank you. just briefly showed how I clean the springs by stretching them out and using the scotch Brite pad and WD-40 and then going over with mineral spirits uh, to take everything off. Well, WD-40 and then a dry cloth to wipe off the, the wet residue and then mineral spirits on the uh, cloth to take off all the WD-40. But you can see this spring was this uh, the spirals were pretty concentric. They were really concentrated in here. And now you can see how much it's been opened up. Just like the other one. The other one is pretty pretty bad and it's it's opened up pretty good. So I think both these springs, after giving them a little stretch, I think they're pretty good. I think they're good to go. So we're gonna we're gonna go with that. And you can see uh they certainly look better than they did. They, they came out of the clock and they were horrible. All right, let's try to get the spring with a retainer clip on them. And uh, that's the next step. We want to re-engage the click here. The click. So when it goes around, it catches, it ratchets. So we just have to reattach this wire and just put it over the little clip like that. There's a little tab there that goes on there. Real easy. And I, I wear safety glasses. You should probably wear gloves because with the spring there's a there's a factor of unpredicted. You can't predict what will happen. If there could be micro fractures in the metal, you never know. And in winding, it can snap and break and burst at any time and you can get cut so always wear gloves although I don't always like to I'm just saying you should and anytime you undertake something the risk is upon you you just want this little notch here to engage the hole in the middle of the spring and when you turn it the whole thing turns you know it's you know it's there so there we go. So I'll put this in here. I'll put this in here. Well, I don't. I don't know where my ratchet is. I have the ratchet that fits on here, but I don't know where it is. So we'll just give it a go without it. It's a little bit harder.
Oh, I should have had this on there first. Should have had that on there first. Now it's on there. This came off the little rod a little bit here. Well, I'm not sure how that happened, but there it is. It's on there. <laughs> oh dear. Anyhow, the, uh, my spring winder is a work in progress. It's clumsy. It's a little clumsy, but it gets the job done. And as I encounter difficulties, like trying to put the ring on because I couldn't get it around this, the wood post is so big. As I encounter problems, I'll make modifications to make it more workable. So when you're on a budget, that's what you do. But in the video, you will see it was, you know, I had to back it off in order to get that uh, C, the C clamp on there. But that's just, that's just how it is. I'm an amateur and I don't have a lot of experience even using this. Hopefully that'll be corrected in the future as I do more and more videos. So, <laughs> it is what it is. Tool, it gets the job done. That's the main thing. Uh, just have to be safe doing it no matter how you do it. Eye protection, probably wearing gloves. Sometimes I dispense with the gloves. Something happens, that's on me. So, just wanted to share that. Okay. Alright, let's try to get this Sakosha clock back together. A lot of people wanted to see how to do that and there are other videos that show how. And the nice thing about the Sakosha movement is you don't need stands to put the movement plate on. They can just sit flat and it's fine. This post here, the center post, it holds the uh, the pillar nut. Once the movement plate comes over, the pillar, the nut goes on and holds the movement plate on but the and gives some stability to the center of the the plate but this one was loose see it, it moves around like this and it's just pressed on with this rivet so i don't think that's supposed to move because when you tighten up the screw that can just go around and round so i'm just going to tighten that up a little bit i don't want to i don't want to bang on the tip of this that'll that'll just flare out and you might not be able to get the nut on so I'm just uh, seeing which hole I can put this in and still have the shoulder showing. Okay, there's the sh it hits the shoulder. There. Okay, we'll do it like that. Oh, there we go. See, now it's tight. It's not turning around. So that's all you need, just a little painting on the end of this uh, rivet or whatever it is here. It's a piece of metal and that keeps it from turning. Just a couple more wax and that should be good. Just to tighten that up. Alright, now if you have not kept your parts separate like time parts and the strike parts and they're all together and you don't know what goes where, I'm going to sort them out and show you. Of course, the first thing you want to put on to get out of the way is the count wheel. And that's another way to know which side is the strike side on the Sakosha movement because the count wheel goes on this raised stud with a groove for the uh, locking washer to go on. And when this is on top, it's going to be on the left hand side. So the left hand side is going to be the striking side or the striking train. On the Sakosha clock. So the first thing we'll do is put the washer back on this raised area here and then the count wheel goes on.
Okay, account mail. And then it and then it had this. There's a little hole right here. See the little hole? And that's where the tip of this horseshoe type washer goes on. So you basically just push it on. Well, I'm doing this up in the air. It's kind of awkward. But you just push that down so you have access to the to the groove. Then you just there. See, it went into there, and now the count wheel. Now, if it's too tight, you can release the tension on this by just bending it up slightly. So, if it's too loose, you would want to bend this down like this, curved, curved like this, curved. But if it's too tight, you can bend it up a little bit take the pressure off so this one was a little tight so now I'm going to put this back on see how that feels there we go okay this is on there and it spins okay now we'll set this aside so that's a couple parts we don't have to worry about. And we'll get back to where does everything go on this Sikosha movement. Lifting levers. I'm going to set these to the top. Okay, and now on each side you have Where's the main wheel with the spring for the time side? The main wheel with the spring for the strike side. And these go around the post here. So you can just put those on now. Just slide those over the posts. And then when we're ready, we just bend these, we just pull these in and put the um, Put it right in the hole there. You have to bend it down a little bit, see? You have to bend it down to get it in there. Now we'll do that in a minute, but in the meantime, let's get all these parts uh, sorted. In the meantime, this is the orientation that these levers are supposed to be in. Okay. You have the, uh, the two pins here. All right, let's, let's take this one out. And now you can see where this lever is supposed to be. It's supposed to be on this, the right side of the of the shaft there. So that's where that goes, right there, between this hole and this one. All right. So let's take that one out. Now what's left is the lifting lever and the lifting lever. There's a pin in the bottom of this wheel and this will spin around until the lifting lever, which it, when it's done striking, will hit that pin. And this will also fall into well, it will, it will go right here and keep it from moving. So this lifting lever goes here. It goes right there. And what that looks like is, you can see that goes in the slot. See how it fits in that slot. And then this this wheel has a little pin here, and that's what it's all. That's what it's in. it stops it and lets it go. So, having shown how these uh, the correct orientation for these levers, and then this one, of course, it goes goes on this side of this lever here. See. Okay, and uh, the wire that gives it a little tension loops around the post on both of those levers, and I'll, 
I'll show you how to put those on later. So, on the let me back up. So on the strike side here, we have the fan governor that goes here. We have the the little wheel with the pin in it that goes face down right here. The next one is the wheel with the two pins on it. They they go face up right here. Okay, and then you have this large wheel with a big beefy cog on the end that goes right here. So when I assemble the strike side, I'm going to put this main wheel in first and then I'm going to put this one, this one, this one, and this one. That's how they go. So in case your, in case your parts got mixed up, this is how they go. Main wheel, great wheel. Second wheel on the strike train. Big beefy cog here. The third wheel with two little pins. The fourth wheel. Little lantern pinion down here. And the little pin on the bottom. And then the little governor, fan governor. Okay, and in the middle, of course, you have the uh, motion works. Uh, goes there, and the uh, the minute gear. I believe that's called the minute gear. Goes right behind it, and then this slides right over the hour pipe like this. So the motion works, that's how those go together. Okay. So let's just take these out. Put these up here. Okay, now on the time side, and once again, in case you got your gears mixed up, this one goes face down here, or with the lantern pinion facing down. All right. And then you have this one, the lantern, lantern pinion facing up. That goes right there. Let's see. And then you have this big one here. This big one goes right here. Like that. And then you have the great wheel that's right here the main wheel that goes on. So it's the main wheel and then you have the big one and this, this one and then this one and we'll worry about the escape wheel later. That's kind of a breakdown so that when I start putting this together you can you can go back and you can see how all these things interact. Alright so the next step is to put everything together and I just once again I just wanted to show people because a lot of videos they do not show the detail and I still am working out how things work but that's how you learn it takes some of these things take a little time alright this striking hammer goes right there and the wire wraps around this corner and comes down. So I just uh, press that in there. Okay, like that. This wheel here has these two pins and these two depressions. So anyhow, what happens is this is supposed to go around a hit and when it releases, when this uh, pin passes the end of the striking hammer tail, it's a, this is supposed to come back because it's supposed to be under tension, see? And this one, is I noticed it was very weak to begin with. I should have adjusted it, but... So it just stays there, and then the next one comes, and then when it hits, 
it's only hitting it's hardly even moving it even if it came back a little bit uh, so there's virtually no tension on there so we want it to come back so the first thing we're going to do is try to adjust the tension on this The more times you take this wire and bend it, it'll break. The end of it actually broke off earlier. So, we'll just uh, take it out and then kind of uh, coax it over. Alright, all I did was press this down a little bit, bending it, bending the wire over a little bit more, just like maybe just a slight extra the small fraction of a turn just to give that a little more tension and then when I put this on the plate thusly I'm going to bend it around this plate like it was before like that maybe crimp it a little more okay so there it is there it is right there. I backed it off a turn or half a turn. There's a little tension here, and I think that's just enough. So now let's let's put this wheel on. Alright, and let's put the front plate on. And we'll just do a little test. Now like I said, this little the the little tail on this hammer the little bent piece it hits this plate and it stops the tail of the uh, striking hammer from going past this point so when this goes when this goes around let's see let's get in here so when this turns around and hits that There you go. It's it has a little cushion and it comes back or spring tension and it comes back. There, now that's better. You don't want a lot of spring tension because this thing doesn't want to. You don't want to have a lot of resistance. I'm not an expert, but that sounds better. Now let's look at it. Okay, let's turn it. You can watch this here. There. You just imagine it striking the wire bell. Okay, that looks and sounds good. So, we'll put this in first. We'll loop it around here. Put it in the proper hole there. Push that down. Okay. So to keep this from flying all the way up there, I can I can put in this hour and hour. Uh, gear here see and then it won't and then it won't go flying all the way back the uh, so that's that's the lifting lever because this lifts that and these are the locking levers because this locks into the count wheel so lifting and locking and if I get some of the names wrong don't uh, beat me up too much about it just say hey that's called this and then I will know we will all know. We will all know. Okay, those two levers are in and they have tension. So, we're going to put the uh, uh, main wheels back in. Loop it on the post. This is on the strike side, it's on the left. Push it till it goes in the 
wall. And we put the, uh, the second strike wheel. The second strike wheel is the big one. There it is. You have the uh, third third wheel and that's what these little pins that hit this, the uh, striking hammer. So those pins face up. We're just going to slide it into here. Right there. And then we put the uh, the, the last uh, fourth wheel with a little pin in it and that faces down. So I'm just going to put the little depressions on each side of the cam here. I'm putting the lifting lever right in there. Okay. Putting that right in there ready to be lifted and this one goes underneath to right there and you have the little flywheel that goes right here all right okay and then I'm going to rotate this uh, well before I put this on I'm going to rotate this pin until it's in the stop position hitting this little hook that arrests the thing from spinning. So right there. And then I'm going to put this in right there. Okay, that's the strike side. So let's, uh, let's re-engage the click here. Put the spring on. Uh, same with this one over here. So when I wind it to take off the C-clamp, it'll click, click, click. Alright, so this one goes in the hole right there. Okay, it's the time side. And then you have the second wheel, which is the largest. It looks like this. And then it goes here. goes here and then you have this little one the fourth one with the lantern pinions on the bottom goes here and then this this little hole in there that's where the uh, escape wheel goes but we're going to put that on last we're going to put that in when we put the uh, cover plate on the front plate. And then this one of course goes the minute uh, wheel goes right minute wheel goes there, see? And then that once uh, that's there then this uh, goes over the hour pipe everything in there see now this count wheel when I put it on I forgot to mention that the side of this wheel in the center that has the most wear that's the side that goes down so you don't want to put this on backwards because it counts the hours and you'll you'll get it reversed oh. so just put things on the way that they came and that's a good sign you'll have you'll be successful all right, now this, if you remember this escape wheel, it, uh, it goes underneath like this. See? And then the whole thing goes, let me rotate this, 
goes right down here. So when it goes in, the lantern pinion of the escape wheel engages this wheel here. So this is going to go on like this. You just have to line up all the holes. as it goes down very carefully and then uh, I have to get ready for work so I will come back uh, later and finish putting this in so now it's just a matter of lining up all the pivots with their respective holes and the um, before you can even get the pillar nuts on. So sometimes it's good to start at one end and work your way down. So if you see something that's uh, standing up, you can right away push it in or pull it over. So you can see the thread is sticking up here on the this pillar nut. And the highest spot is over here in the back. So what you can do is you can you can start one nut just loose just to keep it from coming off. And then you can rotate you can see how this side is higher. So, you want to see what's pushing this up. Let's see if you can just push it into place. Each little hole has to have something in it. So you're just uh, lining everything up. Okay, I can see the minute wheel is not in its under its pivot here, so you can use tweezers or something to get in there. Or a little screwdriver or something to move it the over. There we go. But the plates are still too far apart, so it's not going to go in the hole. There we go. Let's move in this one here and this one. See, see how it's all kind of starting to fall into place. You just got to work on work one, work on one at a time. Some people put rubber bands around the plates to put a little tension on while they work the work the pivots in. Oh, it's this. I'll bet it's this right here. The other part of the hammer. Uh, striker. Okay, now the center pillar is visible and this one's visible. Okay, everything's pushing down here, so now I can I can put on another pillar nut. If if the plate doesn't go down, something's keeping it. So you just have to find the piece that is keeping it from going in. Okay, I'll put the center pillar nut on. Just loose. Okay, that one's in now. And that one is... That one is in, see? See how it clicks as it goes in? And now you have this one. And you have this one. See that? There it is, so the last nut. Okay. You want to make sure you the uh, the count wheel lifting lever or locking lever. 
because it falls into the slots as it goes around make sure that it's not under or over make sure it's just right in the middle there so it engages the teeth nicely uh, once everything is in you can tighten up the pillar nuts and there, there are five of them okay then I'll just use my pliers and go around and if I can do this out of the way of the camera I just snug them up so I just snug those up I didn't notice it before because probably the movement plates were so dirty but there's a little five here and here engraved into the brass yeah. but uh, there's the five I'm pretty sure that has to do with pendulum length in case you lose the pendulum then what size and how to replace but that's essentially what your clock should look like from the front and back and from the side and the other side and the bottom and just take note how the wire on those levers are wrapped around there it is so hot out here right now it's well over a hundred. I want to remove the retaining clip on the spring, on the main spring. So I'll just uh, wind this, wind this down until uh, the spring is compressed enough to that uh, you'll see the, the clamp. It'll fall a little bit when it's there's no more pressure on it. So we'll just wind this up. Makes the springs tighter. Oh, the clip came off. That's all right. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Okay, now it is. Let's see, it's loose. So then I just uh, let's see, it just fell down, and then it'll just come out like that. One person said, and you can't use those uh, sig clamps on these Sekosha clocks. Well, maybe not his, but it works on this one. So I'm going to let the spring unwind because I disengaged the, uh, the click is not engaged. So, so there you go. I'm just unwinding that. So. Okay, now once this is, uh, once the spring is relaxed like this, or open more, that's when you can just uh, put some oil in here. You just, with this needle oiler, it doesn't take much, you just kind of put it across the, dab it in here, dab it in there, and then when you wind it up, it'll compress and it'll push that oil all around. So it'll go in there. You don't need too much. You don't want it dripping, of course. When you wind it up, that'll compress all that oil. It'll compress the springs and it'll distribute the oil.
Well, that's the verge assembly. <clears throat> it's fairly easy to put on. You don't want any big gloves of oil there. But if any oil is squeezed out the side, you can you can just wipe that. That's one way to oil the spring. Another way is to oil the spring while you have it out. After cleaning the final step, you can uh, put the oil on the cloth and run it through the whole spring. But that sometimes makes it a little messy when you're working with the spring later. Okay, so then I'll just do the same with this spring. Take that, take the uh, C clamp off of it. Just wind it up until it drops, and then it just comes out the side. Ice water here. I'll be back after I take that apart. I think I know why this was running, con the, the strike would just run continuously without stopping now. After having the plate on and off, but maybe a dozen times. I found out that. Okay, let's says uh, let's zoom in. That this count wheel, and it's all the way seated in this deepest depression. This should stop, it shouldn't spin. That hook should be arresting the spinning of this wheel. So that is correct. When this is striking the hours, this should spin freely. And that hook should not be arresting, it should just let it spin. And then eventually after this strikes all the hours, whether one, two, three, four, and when it hits the deep one, that's when we're back to this hook arresting. Won't let it spin. So it stops until the next time, or the next hour, when this goes around. And the lever is lifted. And now it's striking again. So this took quite a bit of finagling. And I realized that in Instead of bending the little one down here, I, I did do a little minute adjustments bending that, but the degree between the depth of this hole, the deepest one and the shallow one, was very delicate, where bending this is almost impossible. So what happens is you bend this. So I bent this to make sure it went in the hole and then just bent this back or forward a little bit until it was adjusted. It's really... It's, uh, for not knowing what I was doing, uh, it's a little frustrating, but now I think when I put everything together, this will not be running continually. Striking. Striking continually, I mean. It should be striking and then stopping. So now I will take the plate off, put all the gears back in again, and, and we'll see, uh, we'll see from there. There is one more adjustment I had to do, and that is this count wheel lever. It has to nicely engage each slot, and it wasn't quite going in, and that was because the hammer tail, when the pin hits the hammer tail and moves it right when it releases, or just very shortly after, that's when this is supposed to drop. So what I did is I uh, took a screwdriver and I pushed it in and I pushed that hammer tail I held it here and I pushed it in just a little bit to make everything sync up so now when 
Okay, at the top of the hour, when the lever is lifted, right about here. Okay, see, it's lifting. It's the other one. Lifts the count lever out, and now it begins its striking. And you can see, see, strikes each. There's a little hesitation there, I'm not sure why, but it is working. And then when it when it gets to the end of however many hours it's striking, it'll fall into the deepest slot, and that pin will stop this wheel from moving until the next top of the hour when the when the lifting lever frees the locking levers. See, here we go. And it just hit the last hour. It went all the way in and now that little hook lever won't let this wheel advance. So now I know that that is correct. If there's, oh, and I also took this off the, um, the little lever right here. I'll put it back on and I have to make the, or try to find the little wire that goes here. But that's not a big deal. It just uh, pinches on. Let's see what this wire does when when the the power is released on these uh, wheels. When I take those clamps off, if the strike's the wrong hour, you push this up. And it pulls the, uh, see, it'll pull the, the locking lever for the count wheel out and it'll advance to the next hour until you get the correct hour striking. Now this isn't really the proper tool to be loosening these pillar nuts with. Something that actually fits the nut would be better, like a nut driver. I'm just using this because it's convenient and I don't know where my other tools are. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to note some caution that when you put on to tighten or take off to loosen this nut next to the escape wheel, be careful that you don't slip off and hit the teeth. It's These teeth are really delicate and you don't want to be bending them. This is what regulates the escape of the power and the pendulum. You don't want to mess those up, so just be careful. And if you have to, do everything from this side and put your thumb or something here uh, or hold it like this just, just to make sure that you don't slip and damage those teeth. If you damage those teeth, you will say things your mother didn't want you to say. Okay. Also, like I mentioned, I'm going to make this little wire. I lost the little wire that connects to this post and goes connects to here to keep this from interfering. You don't want this hitting the, the uh, count lever wheel it should not be hitting that, so bring it in enough so that this can freely go up and down like this and not hitting the wire to slow it down at all. So I'm just, I'm going to have it come in about like this. So I'll just make a loop. I have this piece of 25 gauge brass wire. I'm just going to make a loop around the, uh, the post and then uh, braid it. It's real simple. And, uh, connected here. It mo mostly, or maybe a stiffer wire, a wire more stiff, I don't know. 
we'll try it. Anyhow, I'll try to make the little little wire there. I'm just making a little loop end here and then bending this wire around itself like this. I don't know if this is the correct way. I don't even know if I don't even know if there is a right way. All it does is keep this little rod from getting in the way of things. Okay, so I just twisted that a couple times. And uh, let's see, where's my nippers? I'm gonna just cut this off right there. So this is gonna go around here, like that. And when you see where you want it, it still it has to be able to allow this lever to travel. It can't be real tight on here so I'll just push that down a little bit and then uh, I'll just wrap it around the post like that okay I'll take it off and there's a lot of excess here let me cut that this on there, put the nut on top, then this wire is just stiff enough where you can just do a little adjustment if you need to. Just tighten this up a little. Okay, so this wire, all it does is make a little loop to hold this and that should be freely moving in there. See? So I think that's good enough. All right, I just took the mainspring clamp off this side and I'm gonna release the count wheel. It's counting the hours and striking. And when it's done, it'll hit that large depression, the, the next biggest one, and it'll stop. Here we go. That is a beautiful thing. Now, I've just put this popsicle stick in there to keep it from trying to run because it'll tick away without the pendulum giving it a controlled release of power. Now, this pendulum rod with the hook on the bottom, the pendulum of course hangs on this, and the suspension spring up here has a little hole in it and there's a little there was sometimes you will see a little piece of wire and what that's for is if you look at this post where it attaches see if I can get in there okay we're gonna, that's about as close as I can get it so this post is split in two it goes all the way down but on this end it's like somebody crimped it. I could try to open that up, but I don't want to break it. If that snaps off, uh, I'd have to put another one on, if possible. So what this does is there's a little slot underneath. It's real hard to see, but the slit... First, I'll, I'll, let's see here. I'm going to feed this up through the crutch. See, it goes up like this. And then the end of it is going to go right in that slot in the post. Okay, and now that it's there, you can see how it's it's gone all the way through. The weight of the pendulum will pull this out, so you need some something to go in there to stop it. I cut off a piece of 22 gauge wire, brass wire, 
and it's slightly larger than the hole. So if I push it in, there we go. That is going to stay there. I oh, it's a little bit loose. So all right, let's bend that. We'll bend it. We'll just bend it, and then it will not come out. I'm sorry I'm in the way of the camera. That's just the way it is right now. Let me get the let me get a bend started in here and put it back in here. Okay, I put a little U in it. So when it goes through the hole this time, there we go. I can just push these two sides together a little bit. There. All right, well, it's a little bit crude, but I got it in there and I bent it over. So the, the point is, it, this will not fall through. That's what you're after. So whether it was just a little stud going across, which I could have done, or this looped wire, I've seen it both ways. I'm not sure which pro what is proper, but there it is. Now when it comes to oiling, uh, there are just as many different ways to oil a clock and opinions as to how to do it as there are clocks themselves everyone has something they like I use a little bit heavier oil on the mainspring the um, the regular gears the pivots I don't think they require uh, heavy oil this is a uh, Whitlock's uh, clock oil I bought this it was recommended that's what I'm going to use but I used a 040 weight synthetic mobile one oil I think it was for the mainspring it's just a little bit thicker and it's real hot here so I think that'll be fine and some people say don't use any kind of automotive oil but Ken's clock clinic has a paper on if you research it on the internet he has a paper that goes, it breaks down all the different oils, clock oils, motor oils, synthetic oils, even from when they first started with whale oil, and it compares them and tells which one is best for which application. I'll let you decide what kind of oil you want to use, but what I do is uh, the little oil sink around each pivot. Okay, it's a little sink, and if you you don't want to fill that up with oil, because if you because this is going to be on the wall, so it's going to be this way, and if you fill it up with oil, the oil is going to run out. It's going to run down the plate, and you'll see, you've seen you'll see a lot of plates with the uh, runs on them, and they subsequently dried. But when the oil runs out, you put in too much. The oil runs out and it pulls the oil behind it out as well. And so this pivot will eventually go dry because it was oiled too much. So what I do is... Alright, you only want to put in enough oil to fill up one third of that sink. And if your needle oiler is too big... Let's see if this one's too big. You just get a little bit on the end and you touch it. That is more than enough right there. In fact, that might be too much. You can always wick some away with a uh, something absorbent if you think there's too much. Okay, basically get everything, get the pivot wet and to the point where it's just coming up and that's good. You don't want it running out. I think that's okay. Maybe I'll try this oiler here. Otherwise, I use this little watch oiler, and you, what, do you, what you do is you dip it in the cup. You dip it in the oil in the little cup, and then you touch the uh, pivot. And, let's see here. You might have to make several dips, because this is for watches, and it's super small. Yeah, see, that's not even getting in there. On that bigger one, I might use this.
That really, this one really doesn't have a sink on it, but it doesn't really have a sink. Okay, that's not going to be running out. So you just, you just want to have everything coated, that's all. And then you go around to uh, each one. Is that even in the camera? I can't see. I got my... I hope you can see all that. Okay, I did this one. Now we'll do uh, this one here. See, that's all. Just a little touch. And like I said, people do it differently. I tend to put more on, like on those mainsprings, I put more than I should have. I just don't want it dripping, so I take away the excess. There you go. So I'll go around to each of the pivot holes. The, uh, the faces of the pallet here can have one drop of oil each, I've heard, but uh, not necessarily oiling these teeth. Some people say you can put a couple drops of oil on the teeth. I don't know. The striking hammer could probably use some in that. The striking hammer does a lot of striking. So you get the oil in there. And with a needle oiler like this and you set it down, make sure you set it away from your face because when you have your glasses on you can't see very good and you don't want to bend down and jab that needle in your eye. So just be careful. Because I'm putting my head down here to, to look really close as I do this. See where these levers are? There's a lever, this lever up here. Not really, it doesn't really have a sink, but okay, that's a little too much. So I just go around to each uh, point with a, with a lever or a um, pivot. All right. And I'll turn it over to, to the other side and we'll be done with the oiling. Just on the pallet face there. This is my little screwdriver that grips the screws and holds them until you put them in place. They're not for really tightening down, they're just for putting them in place, getting them started, and then you use a regular screwdriver to finish them off. But that keeps the screw from falling over, especially if you have to go down into a uh, hard to access area. Now, I'm missing a couple of screws. One. Oh, just one. I'm missing one. I have some in here, let's see. Let's see, I'm sure this goes with some clock, but I've long forgotten. That one looks about the right size. Oops. Yeah, that's going to be good. Alright, we'll just use that one. And then we'll tighten it up with a regular screwdriver. Just I snug them up. I, when I say tighten them up, I don't mean I'm like you're working on a car or something. And no, you just you just want them snug. 
You don't want to stripping out the uh, the hole. And if the holes are too loose, you can put a sliver of wood in there. Some of these holes had, uh, I think, a piece of wire in them. All right, those are a little bit stripped. I'm going to put a little piece of wood in there. So one, two, three. Just like a little piece of a sliver of a toothpick, and that'll tighten them up. I'm just going to clip off a piece of this toothpick to put in the hole that's a little too big. It got stripped out for some reason. Sometimes that's all it takes to uh, tighten up a hole, tighten up a screw. Let's see what happens. Sometimes you have to put in more than one piece. Okay, that's nice and snug now, before it wasn't. Now this, I'll test this one. All right, that one spins around too. Yep, that one's, uh, it's bottomed out and it just goes round and round. So let's take that out. And I'll do that to each one of them that needs it. The metal bracket on the bottom, you put a nail in there and that keeps it from moving back and forth like this. What happens with wall clocks is you open the door, the doors are usually heavy, and it causes all the weight to shift to the right, and then the clock can tilt tilt like that, putting it out of beat. So I'll uh, see where the level is here. That looks pretty good. And now I'll go underneath and I'll just punch it with my little punch. And I'll put a little screw in there that'll keep it from moving. Just a little one. Alright. The screw's in there in the bottom bracket to keep it from going this way so the door can be open and closed safely and let's see just to see where we're at here let me turn the air conditioner off and let me let's see gonna zoom in a little bit just to see what's going on with the uh, pendulum I'm not gonna spend a lot of time putting this in the beat uh, I mean I, a lot of this I'm gonna do off camera but just to show you because generally, if the clock is not level and the beat is not even, you can tilt the case one way or the other. And if you tilt it one way and then it becomes level, you can you can make it you can put the case back to where it's level, and then bend this wire here, the crutch, the crutch wire. You bend it in the direction. I think it's the direction of the, you had to tilt the. Uh, the case. Mantle clocks work that way too. If it's the clock won't beat even and you lift one side and then you're supposed to and then, and then the beat is even and then you bend that the crutch wire in that position gen gently because it's kind of delicate and then that compensates for the tilt so when you put it back level the bend in the wire keeps the beat even. But now that this is cleaned up and oiled, uh, we'll see how it does just being level. Let's see if it'll even run. It's kind of scary. Ooh, scary. Alright, 
it's not even so I'm going to take the screw out under here and I'm going to see which way I need to move this case in order for it to be level I'll move it this way first just a little bit at a time see if it the tick evens out stopped okay so let's get it going again and we'll move it this way this time okay that's a little better Okay, see that went too much. That sounds pretty good. I'm not, a, again, I'm an amateur, I'm not an expert, but it sounds pretty even. And now what I had to do was move it this way, so if I bend the wire that way, I think that will compensate. Let me put this back into level and put this uh, screw back in. Then I'll bend the crutch wire a little bit. Okay. Which means you, you just bend it ever so slightly this direction. see if that did anything. Still a little off. So let's do it a little more. Just a little more. I'm, I'm bending this part here. I'm not bending it where the natural curve is here. I'm bending it here. Oh, there. See, now it wants to run. So that's actually a good indication. All right, let's see what we got. See, I'm not sure if that's in beat or out of beat. It's close. I'm going to try it a little more, and if that sounds too pronounced, I will put it the other way. So, just a little, just a little bit. Hold still. Okay, that sounds good. And this crutch wire is actually not exactly in the middle of the where the pendulum hangs, so I'm just going to bend that back a little bit this way. So, let's uh let's bend that just a little bit that way. Now let's try this. So you just have to fool around with it a little bit until you get a nice even back and forth tick tock. And then again, ideally you should let it run for a week to see how it does. I also had to put toothpicks in each of the holes that hold the 
dial pan on and there's only uh, four screws there should be six so I have to locate two more later on uh, but I could I can do that anytime and that's more than enough to for it to be secure all every screw would you turn it in to e each hole it would just turn around and around so we'll have to I'll have to uh, locate some of those Sometimes a hardware store has ones that are close with the slotted head and the size. So I'll take one out and go down and check tomorrow. Alright, the only other thing is the, the little latch on the side. There's supposed to be a little eye hook. And what they had on there was a, was a like an old screw. Totally rusted. In fact, I think it was this one. And at the very least, it should be a panhead screw or a little brass eyelet. So I'm going to look for an eyelet too. But in the meantime, I'm going to consider this done. I think it certainly looks better than it did. You remember the early videos. It still has this mark up here. I'm not going to worry about it. Oh, I guess I should put the hands on it. I guess the hands would help. Okay, that's where it should be. Right there. Let me see if I have a... Uh, I know I have a washer in here. Hand washer. I can't find where I had the original washer. If it had one, I don't remember. But I filed this one a little bit. All right, still a little small. Okay, that fits on there now. But I, it's too rounded, so I don't have access to the hole. So I have to, this is concave, so I just have to flatten it out a little bit. Hit it with a little hammer. Okay, now I can put the pin in. The star of the show isn't me, it's the nice clock from I believe the night night around 1920 Sekosha 8 day wall clock we'll find out how long it runs but still a little few few little minor things to do the extra screws for the dial pan the eye hook on the side I forgot about getting one and everything had just been sitting around for so long for so many months and that's what happens when you stretch projects out you they get dusty again you lose things it's just not good so what I learned what I learned is that if I ever do another series like this one part one part two part three I'm gonna film the whole thing and I'm not gonna put any of them up until I'm finished that way one week you put up part one next week you put up part two I learned that from my friend Practical Fixes. He said, um, have, it in, have them done in advance like that. So I apologize to everyone that has been waiting and waiting and waiting for this series to finish. And I would like to thank, yes, I would like to thank the, the people that actually encourage me when's the last episode coming when when are you going to finish did i miss it what happened i appreciate i appreciate all those people asking because it encourages me and pushes me to get things done so it's finally done uh, going forward 
I have the little area that I'm building here in the workshop just for clock repair and it'll make things so much more efficient I believe and I have a lot of projects going forward that I'd like to do and now that this is finished it actually feels like a weight off my shoulders so I, I ran into problems myself especially with the lifting levers the lifting and locking levers and there's not a lot of information on the internet about that I saw some from uh, Scotty's clock world he was explaining lifting levers I tried to look in some books for other makes regarding, but the Seikosha uh, wall, wall clock, there's really not anything specific for that. So if anyone has one of these clocks in pieces, hopefully my video will help them putting theirs back together and how all the parts are supposed to work. So I'm just thankful that it's finished. So until next time, I wish the best for everyone and hope you're all in good health all right we'll see you next time so long for now I will also say that anyone who's been following this entire series can remember what horrible condition this pretty poor condition this clock was in and now it's a little better I think There's a little catch on the bottom that has a screw in it to keep it from moving. So once again, I appreciate everyone watching and giving me words of encouragement. I do appreciate it. And I thank each one so much for watching.